Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Rand Hindi, the CEO and co-founder of Zama. Zama leverages um, fully homomorphic encryption for all kinds of privacy stuff that we'll talk about in just a second. Introducing the next generation of DYDX and the next version of the DYDX token. Welcome to the DYDX chain. New token mechanics mean you can stake to secure the network. Staking is fully decentralized and controlled by DYDX token holders. All fees are distributed to stakers. Earn rewards from using the DYDX protocol, with rewards planned for traders and early adopters too. New governance means you are in control. Trading has been democratized. You can vote on protocol improvements, token distributions, and more. Bridge your DYDX to seamlessly transition to DYDX chain. Bridge now at bridge.dydx.trade and contribute to the evolution of DYDX chain, open source and community driven. Run your own validator. Validating is fully permissionless. Join us on our mission to democratize access to financial opportunity today. Before we start properly, Rand, thanks for coming on. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Rand. I'm an entrepreneur and investor in deep tech. Uh, I started coding when I was 10 years old, built my first company as a teenager, then did a PhD in AI in 2007 before it was actually a cool thing to do. Um, I've then, I've, I was then running an AI company focusing on privacy that got acquired in 2019. And since 2020, I've been running Zama with my co-founder, Pascal Payet. Uh, and I also do quite a bit of investing in deep tech. So my sweet spot as an investor is companies that most other investors cannot understand yet. Ah, that sounds fascinating. What kind of, can you give us some examples of companies you've invested in or you're thinking of investing in? Sure. At the moment, I'm looking a lot at uh, biotech, specifically psychedelics, longevity. Uh, my PhD was in AI applied to biology, so I can read bi bio paper just as well as I can read AI papers. And so I was able to get in early on a lot of things that people thought were like sci-fi medicine. Uh, so for example, I, I invested in a company that's doing like a miniature MRI called Chipiron. It's an MRI machine that's 10 times smaller and cheaper than existing ones. So something you can put to the back of like an ambulance and things like that. When I invested, nobody thought it was even possible to build it. And now these guys just produced their first MRI images. Yeah, super cool. And obviously longevity has uh, also seen um, quite the boon over the last couple of years. Um, any, any notable investments there? Um, I mean, I've been investing quite a few things. My most recent investment is in a diagnostics company called Glycanage, uh, where they basically analyze some very specific markers in your blood called glycans, which gives you a good estimation of your biological age, but also of all kinds of different diseases that might uh, progress in the future. Uh, great company, very strong science, 20 years of research, just something most people overlooked. And so I always try to find those things, you know, those sort of non-obvious bets where the science is very, very strong, but nobody really thought about making a company out of it. Uh, super cool. Um, I think we, we will kind of see how this um, segues into privacy in just a bit. So basically all of these biotech companies, kind of the ones that kind of tell you your biological age and kind of your risk markers and so on, um, I would be absolutely thrilled to kind of know where I, where I stand. The reason I've never taken any of these tests is because I'm concerned about um, the privacy of the data. So going from that to kind of like a privacy-focused space, it's quite a leap. And then on some levels, it's, it's not. So kind of tell us kind of what, um, what kind of drove you to kind of found something so intensely mathematical and kind of like computation ba based. I mean, it's a, it's a tool set. Right. So basically it's kind of, it's not, yeah. So basically what, what made you do it? Actually that dates back from when I was 14 years old. Um, <laughs> so at the time I was 14 in the nineties. So it was the beginning of the internet. You know, people were starting to build websites. And since I was coding, since I was a kid, for me, it was easy to start building websites. And at the time with a friend, we had built a social network uh, that was quite popular in France. Um, so the reason why I'm saying this is because at some point at school, 
I got bullied by an older kid, right? I mean, you know, when you're 14, the guy's 16, he's twice my size. What can I do about it, right? And I got so fed up of this guy that I thought, well, maybe he's a user of my social network. So perhaps if I looked into his private messages, I could find something compromising and blackmail him so that he would stop. So I looked into the database and I found amazing things about him, which I challenged him with and I say, hey, if you ever mess with me again, everybody's going to know about your dirty little secret and your secret crush. He never, ever spoke to me again or approached me. So victory, I bullied the bully. But then I thought something's wrong about what I just did. Just because I'm the one operating the service doesn't mean I should be able to see everybody's data. And so from that point, in 1999, I knew that privacy was going to be a very important topic for the future of the internet and of, you know, just digitizing everything. So as far as I can remember, I've always tried to think about privacy as just as a necessity, as something that you build by design in everything that you put out there. That's very true. I, I feel makes me feel bad for the bully uh which almost you almost never do right it's kind of like but uh yeah it's kind of he probably didn't even think about the fact that you you had kind of clear text access to kind of messages he was sending no but nobody thought about that in the 90s right like it, it wasn't something people talked about and uh and yeah and so i think i don't feel bad about it because if anything that particular episode eventually made me focus on privacy, made me create Zama. And if anything, more people will benefit from privacy because this guy bullied me and forced me to confront at the time the fact that I had access to so much data and that this was wrong. So, you know, silver lining, he stopped bullying me and hopefully a lot of people will end up benefiting from that. So you just said that you co-founded with um, a CTO. That's Dan, um, yeah. Yeah. How did you guys meet? Pascal is like Pascal. Pascal Payet is super OG in homomorphic encryption. You know, he's one of the early inventors of homomorphic encryption. He was the first one to invent uh, homomorphic addition, so the ability to add encrypted numbers in the '90s as well. Actually, so when I was doing my social network, he was inventing that. Um, and him and I have been friends for a few years. You know, we kind of like hang out and uh, we kept in touch. And when he he heard that I was selling my previous company. He reached out and he said, hey, I just had a breakthrough in homomorphic encryption. I think now's the right time to build a company. Do you want to do it together? And quite frankly, initially, I thought, I don't know, man. I'm kind of like tired. I want to do the whole like sell my company, take six months, travel the world kind of thing. But then I thought, how often do you get a chance to build a company at the right time with the perfect co-founder based on that new scientific breakthrough? And so I just couldn't resist. So a week after I sold my company, we started Zama. <laughs> um, that was in 2019. And that was um, before... 2020, um, the, officially 2020. 2020, yeah. sorry. Be before the ZK boom. So kind of, kind of, if you look at kind of like um, the trajectory of kind of ZK technology and kind of the mind space it's taken up um, in, in uh, uh, the ecosystem... Um, that was just the very, very beginning. And you guys weren't even primarily working on ZK stuff, but fully homomorphic encryption, which is kind of like um, two, two pay grades beyond, uh, you know, vanilla uh, ZKPs. Um, we'll talk about kind of the differences between all of these technologies in just a bit. Back then, the only project that I'm aware of who was aiming to use fully homomorphic encryption was Numerai. I don't know whether that's still going, but kind of um, w when you came out and said, I will build something on this. Um, basically, fully homomorphic encryption has been around for 50 years or so, um, but basically making it usable, this has kind of been the holy grail. It's not, it's not really been done so far. So kind of what, what, how did people react when you came out with this? So fully homomorphic encryption was actually only figured out in 2010. Before that, you could only do either additions or multiplications, but you couldn't do both. Uh, 2010 is the first time that someone invented a homomorphic technology where you could do any kind of computation. Uh, the problem is it was extremely slow, very, very slow. It was very hard to use for things that required complex computation. 
And unless you had a PhD in cryptography, you couldn't really use it. So, you know, the big contribution from Zama is that we actually created a homomorphic scheme that is very fast, that can, that can do any kind of computation. So it can do any kind of thing you want to do without any sort of difference to the data was not encrypted. And it's very easy to use. So as a developer, you don't have to learn anything about cryptography. Uh, and so I think, you know, from a mathematical perspective, we've solved FHE. Now it's purely about making it used by as many people as possible and then improving performance all the time. I think maybe this is the time to kind of explain all of these terms in depth, right? So basically, in terms of privacy, people tend to think in different tiers. So tier one is ZK proofs, which we have talked about on the shows many times. So basically, um, it, it's this idea that you can prove um, your knowledge of something without revealing um, the thing itself. And um, they're typically generating the proof um, is computationally expensive, but can be done off-chain, and then anyone can verify it on-chain. Um, tier two, that we don't actually talk all that uh, that often about, is uh, multi-party computation. And then in my head, kind of tier th three is kind of like the holy grail tier, uh, fully homomorphic encryption. Um, can you explain the differences between ZKPs, MP MPCs, and FHE? That's a good question. They're fundamentally very different technologies. And I believe that three of them have a role to play in building a privacy protocol. Uh, zero knowledge proofs are great when you want to prove something without revealing the data. But it doesn't actually allow you to compute on the private data itself. So whoever has to produce a proof has to actually have the data. So for example, you know, if I want to create a ZK proof that I have enough tokens, me, the prover, have to have access to the actual balance. Otherwise, I cannot prove anything about it. So if you wanted to actually compute on an encrypted balance, you wouldn't do that with ZK. That's really not what this is about. ZK is a technology that, get, that creates proof of correctness. It's not a technology about computing on private data. If you want to compute on private data, you've got basically MPC, multi-party computation, and FHE. At least if you're talking about software-based solutions. You have hardware-based solutions, but let's stick to software-based solutions. The idea of multi-party computation is that instead of having one machine do the computation, you basically split the data and the program to be executed on multiple machines, each of them doing a piece of it and then putting the result back together. So as long as you know, a majority of those machines are honest, Nobody can retrieve the original encrypted data. They can only retrieve the final results. Uh, MPC is great. The only downside is that you're limited by networking time. So at some point, it doesn't matter how fast the machines go because sending data back and forth is going to be the bottleneck. FHE is basically running on a single server. So you encrypt the data and you compute on the encrypted data itself without having to decrypt it. And because this happens on one single server, you could always throw more computational power at it and make it faster, contrary to MPC. So what we believe is the holy grail of privacy, and what we do at Zama, actually, people only realize that, is we use FHE for computing on the private encrypted data. We use ZKP to make sure the user is doing what it's supposed to do at the end. And we use multi-party computation to secure the private key and decrypt the result of the homomorphic computation whenever we need to. So MPC is great for managing the keys. ZK is great for proving stuff about what users are doing. And FHG is great for doing the computation itself. And that's really how people should think about combining them. Okay, let me kind of um, see whether I got this right by kind of just recapping it. So kind of if you look at fully homomorphic encryption, um, it's kind of like by, by giving the example of kind of say um, my sequence genome. So I would kind of um, encrypt the genome that I sequenced or kind of I, I had someone sequence and send it to these biotech institutes that kind of can tell you what your risk factors are and so on. And then they can do computation on my genome without knowing what exactly 
they're looking at, they're just doing their computation on it. Exactly. And then kind of they send me the result back and I can encrypt it with my private key. Correct. Yes, that, that would be the simplest way to think about FHE. So if you wanted to do that with ZK, it would be the other way around. So in the case of ZK, the user, me, would run the you know genomic analysis on my own computer, on my unencrypted genome sequence, and I would then produce a proof that I've correctly executed the program and send back the result alongside with the proof so that I don't need to show them the actual genome input. So this would be typically if the you know, if the research uh, organization wants only the result of the analysis, but they don't want to see your individual data, that's how you could potentially do it. So you see you're swapping things around. In the case of ZKP, it's not the company that's providing a service doing the computation, it's you, the user, doing the computation and just sending them the result and a proof that this result is for the correct data. Okay, so basically it's kind of like, say, um, I want to take out new health insurance and kind of they want proof that kind of I am generally healthy and I kind of I want to be uh, charged like on exactly. the lowest tier. So I don't need to tell them exactly what my ailments are, but basically I can tell them that I'm generally a healthy person by kind of sending exactly, a ZK Exactly, exactly. But see, you're the one doing the computation. In the case of FHE, you would encrypt your data, send it to them, and they would do the computation and you would then send back their other results. That sounds like magic because as someone who kind of who is processed large batches of data before, typically the first thing that you do with data is you clean it up, right? So basically that is in the right format. And does if FHE, FHE work even with data that's not cleaned up? Say for instance, I take a picture of a natural scene and kind of I want image processing about kind of what we see, say dog walking across the street and kind of a uh, traffic light and whatever kind of like, yeah, automatic processing um, usually happens. Can this happen on data that's not been tidied? Absolutely. FHE, FHE is Turing complete. So anything you can do on unencrypted data, you can do on encrypted data with FHE. The question is, how efficient is it going to be? So often, in often cases, you probably want to do some of the pre-processing before you encrypt the data and send it as FHE, because if you can, why not? It's cheaper, right, at the end. But for image processing, we have an example. If you go on the Hugging Face, uh, Zama has like a space where we actually have a demo of uh, an encrypted image filtering application. So it's literally that. You upload an image, it encrypts it, send it to the server, the server applies different filters on it, and you get back the response. So 100%, like FHE does not have any requirements on what kind of data is being computed on. You can do whatever you want. Okay, I, I, I'm still kind of struggling. So this seems like magic. So so basically kind of if, if I think about this, say for instance, I ask um, an LLM something, right? Kind of like an embarrassing question that I don't want the makers of OpenAI to know that I have, right? So basically... Um, let's say I, I send an encrypted version of it, um, but basically the, the 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 way that kind of say LLMs work and also kind of um, like these image processing um, softwares is that they kind of uh, quote unquote understand something about the data, right? So basically, kind of it they have context. So kind of how does the embedding in the context work in terms of FAG? When you think about AI or any other application, you have some inputs. There is some data going into the model. This data is then transformed. You're applying all kinds of different algorithms on it. So it could be you know, looking up value in a table for your embeddings, or it could be uh, applying like an activation function on the data, right? All of these things, you could do an FHE in exactly the same way. So the program itself doesn't change. The only difference is that the inputs are encrypted. And so if you look at the input itself, you're only going to see some gibberish. Unless you have the key to put things back in order, you're not going to understand much. But the particularity of the way that this was encrypted is that it conserves some mathematical properties. So for example, adding two encrypted numbers would result in the same thing as adding two unencrypted numbers. Um, so a good analogy is like, Imagine you have a box, okay? Um, 
so you cannot see what's inside the box. You can put something inside the box, but you cannot really see what's inside the box. But you know, that box has a few buttons and a few knobs that you can turn. You know, maybe one button squashes whatever is inside the box. Maybe one button sprays red paint on it. So even though you don't know what's inside the box, you can still press a button that will squash it. You can still press the other button that would make it red. And when you take out whatever object was in the box, it will be squashed at red, right? So the person who applied the transformation on the data didn't have to actually see the data itself that was in the box. He just had to know that there was something in the box and just press those buttons. It's exactly the same idea here, right? It basically, encrypting is just putting something into this box and giving this box to you and you are the one pressing the buttons on it. Um, so you know exactly what you did. You just don't know what you did it on. I think on some level to me that makes sense, but kind of especially kind of when you have um, a large repository that you kind of have trained your data on, it kind of it seems intuitive to me that kind of maybe you, sh you, you should have had to do the same thing on your on the data you used for training um, so that kind of you actually compare apples with apples rather than apples with, you know, really squished, squished and, you know, green apples. Ah, but it, it is the same thing. Right. It's just that it's translated into a different language, but it's fundamentally the same data. So when you train your model, right, what you're doing is you're telling it, you know, if that number is five, I want to multiply by two. If the number is six, I want to divide it by three, let's say something like that. Yeah. That logic, the application itself still holds as long as the input that represents, you know, the value you want to transform is able to support those operations you want to do on it. Okay. So if you encrypt the data, but the encrypted data can still be multiplied and divided and things like that, then it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's like you're basically just shifting the space that you're operating in, but you're not changing the operations that you're applying on it. Okay. And that was the big difficulty of FHE is supporting all of those different operators on the encrypted data. Okay, but just to be perfectly clear, the only thing that kind of needs to be encrypted is kind of the data that I send. Basically, you're Correct. using kind of the, the plain text operations that kind of I would use on unencrypted yes. data as well. Okay. That, and that, that's exactly a challenge, by the way. Like FHE for 50 years, the whole challenge was, can we do any operation on the data, not just additions or multiplications? Okay, yeah, so... Um, I hear you, and I think I've read this before. Still seems crazy to me, but uh, I mean, this is often, I mean, it's math, Which is right? exactly a reason why we put so much effort into building good developer tools so that people don't have to figure it out. Because at the end of the day, people don't care about how it works, right? They care about it working. So the users want to know that the inputs they're sending aren't readable. The developers want to know the applications we're building are going to behave as expected. And that's it. And as long as you can guarantee that, the internals and the mathematics, which I agree, sounds like black magic, honestly, most people are probably not going to care. Uh, I mean, at that point, I'm the CEO here in the company, and I'm, I'm pretty good at math and coding. I can't even keep track of everything happening inside Zama. There is like, there's so much complexity in terms of the underlying mathematics, and it's okay. You know, it's not our job to understand those things, to use them. And we've been told time and time again that um, commercial use of FHE is years in the future. From what from what you're saying, sounds like you disagree and kind of it can be used for things now or things soon. Um, where do you think kind of this disconnect comes in? Well, I think that people saying that aren't the people working on it. So it's very difficult to know. The, it's very difficult to know what's possible unless you're yourself in the field. At some point, it becomes evident to everyone. But you know, ZK today seems obvious to everyone. But it was very obvious to a small group of people five years ago as well, right? FHE is the same. You know, FHE today is obvious to people working in FHE that this is working. It hasn't yet transpired to everybody else. So, you know, short answer is it depends who you're asking to. The longer answer is, um, they're kind of right, because up until now, FHE was not yet practical. Uh, you know, there were three problems. 
it was limited in terms of what you could do with it. It was very difficult to use as a developer, and it was very slow. Zama made it very easy to use. We've made it such that you can do anything you want with it. You don't have to worry about what's coming in, what's coming out. We've taken care of everything. Performance is the last mile. So right now, we can basically, let's take blockchain as an example, you know, using uh, homomorphic encryption in a blockchain. Right now, we can support between two and five transactions per second. It's not bad, considering that most L2s on average only actually have five TPS. So FHE today already matches the average load of most EVM chains. We believe that we can 10x that number just with better cryptography in the next 18 months. So where you're going to get to like, you know, 15, 20 TPS in the next, you know, uh, in the next couple of years. So that basically is the same throughput as Ethereum. So for blockchain, FHE works, period, done. If you want to have a thousand transactions per second, then you need some additional uh, hardware accelerators. You know, you need like a kind of GPU for homomorphic encryption if you want to go beyond this 10 or 20 transactions per second. So... You know, if you want to use it for something that you would do on Ethereum, done. It works. If you want to use it for something you would do on Solana, then you need this hardware accelerator. Okay. Um, maybe it's time to kind of go into the products and services that you currently offer. Um, so what's on offer? So Zama is a full stack company. Uh, we basically have a solution all the way down from, you know, FPGA and GPU acceleration all the way up to solutions for blockchain and machine learning. At the core of everything we do, there is a unique technology we built called TFHE, uh, which we basically have like in a FHE developer library. And on top of that, we've built one solution for machine learning where you can take some Python code, so an existing model that you wrote in Python, and we automatically convert it into a homomorphic equivalent that can work on encrypted data. So as a data scientist, you don't have to learn anything about cryptography. You just write Python code and we take care of everything else. On the blockchain side, things were a little bit more complicated. Um, so we basically created this product called the FHEVM, which is a way to have confidential smart contracts in EVM chains using homomorphic encryption. And so... That particular protocol works great, but it's a little bit more than just FHE because you have multiple users, you know, interacting with each other. You need composability between contracts. Uh, and so this is where we're using MPC, for example, for key management. So our FHE VM protocol uses FHE for the on-chain secret computation, but it also uses MPC for managing the secret key of the network. And this FHE VM. Is it live today? Can I run it on Ethereum? Is it like its own chain? What are the costs? There is a set of pre-compiles that you need to integrate into your EVM chain to support homomorphic encryption. So it doesn't work on Ethereum. It would work on any chain, any EVM chain who just basically implements those pre-compiles pretty much. So it's a very easy integration, uh, but it does require effectively to at least soft fork the EVM itself. I don't think Ethereum will ever use FHE just because of the computational requirements. Uh, it's just not in the spirit of Ethereum of running that like on cheap hardware, right? I think you know, FHE still needs some pretty powerful hardware. Uh, so there are a number of companies integrating the FHE VM. The first one that's public who announced it is called Phoenix. So Phoenix is a new L2 uh, based on homomorphic encryption using our technology uh, that's built by the, the team behind Secret Network that's already like a privacy network. So they're launching this new protocol called Phoenix. Uh, great guys, incredible team, uh, great investors too. So they, ra they raised like a 7 million seed round led by Multicoin. Uh, so I think that's going to be probably one of the very successful projects. But let's just say that if we do our job right, homomorphic encryption will be a commodity technology in blockchain. Because when you think about it, Right now on a blockchain, everything is public. If you want to build any kind of confidential application, you're going to need something like homomorphic encryption. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of let's talk. I mean, I, 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 the use case to me is absolutely clear. I'm still not clear on kind of the technical implementation. Say I want to launch um, a an FHE-enabled 
um, chain um, SNL to one Ethereum. First of all, does everything need to be um, fully homomorphically encrypted or can I do like plain text things and FHE things on the same chain? That's a great question. Um, you can do both at the same time. In fact, we don't actually change the EVM itself. You can take an existing EVM. So let's say you take a Go Ethereum. Okay, get. Yeah, you use that. You can take that and you basically add the Zama precompile libraries, which are basically linking your EVM to our FHE library so that you can start doing FHE stuff in Solidity. But the way you do that is that we expose some new data type in Solidity. So basically an encrypted integer, an encrypted Boolean value. And in your contract, you can specify what's supposed to be encrypted, what's not encrypted. So you have full composability, not just between encrypted FHE contracts, but also between encrypted and non-encrypted states. And that's a very important part because you can take an existing chain that's already running and without changing anything, without breaking anything, you can add FHE capabilities on top of it. Let's just stay on the same chain, right? So basically if, if everything kind of happens on one chain, how do you deal with um, composability if like some parts are plain text and some parts are encrypted? FHE can work. Uh, so FHE operations can work between two encrypted values, between two ciphertexts, but it can also work between a ciphertext and a plain text value. Uh, so the operators in FHE basically exist for both flavors. Uh, so that part is, I would say, uh, a natural feature of FHE technologies. Um, what's really difficult is actually composability between encrypted states. Because if you think about it, if you have multiple users or multiple contracts interacting with each other, it does imply that they've all encrypted their data under the same public key. Because if the data is encrypted under different keys, it cannot be mixed, right? It just won't work. So it has to be under one global network key. And so if there is one global network key that everybody's encrypting under, the question is, who has the decryption key and how do you selectively determine who's allowed to see which encrypted value, right? How do you decrypt what for who? And this is where MPC comes in. The smart contract itself can define access control logic. It can say, this user who owns this balance can decrypt its own balance. Makes sense, right? And the way this works is that the validators will split the private key of the network in different pieces and you need a majority threshold uh, approval for something to be decrypted. So it's called threshold decryption. And by having this threshold decryption combined with you know, your traditional blockchain, you can actually have you know, this decentralized system where nobody has a private key and where the smart contract dictates what can be decrypted or not. I think I understand that. Um, so this means that kind of theoretically things can't be stolen from you, but kind of if enough um, of the MPC key holders collude, um, the network state could be frozen, right? I mean, not necessarily. If the, if, if the MPC nodes collude, it doesn't change anything to the blockchain itself. It only means that they would be able to decrypt anything they want. So the worst is that you would lose confidentiality, but you would never be able to double spend or anything like that because of that. But I would argue that you know if you don't have an honest majority in your protocol, it's broken anyway, so you probably shouldn't use it. Uh, but having said that, you know securing an MPC protocol is a very very tricky thing, very very tricky. Uh, so most likely, we believe that this is going to go through a combination of this threshold MPC protocol running inside some kind of secure enclave. So for example, if each of the MPC node participants are running the MPC software inside an HSM, then you will need to break multiple HSMs at the same time faster than the keys are rotating. And so, you know, arguably this means that, you know, and I don't even think a government could do it because if those nodes are in different countries, nobody would have full access to all of them at the same time. So you would need some kind of global international you know, uh, operation where people synchronize to break HSM in a few minutes. If they can do that, they can break into any bank. So the goal here is to make this protocol bank grade security, right? Okay. H how, how fast are keys rotated? That you can determine 
pretty much any way you want. I would say at least as as often as validators rotate. Okay. And in terms of kind of like MPC n numbers, so kind of how, how many uh, how many uh, parties do you recommend? Because I mean, kind of you need like you need to cover like different jurisdictions. You kind of need to have like geographical independence and the operator independence and so on. Um, so kind of to just so just so to make sure that you don't have run into like either a um, jurisdictional um, catastrophe or kind of like a dark DAO scenario. Uh, these are very, very important questions. These are very hard questions. I, I think today the hardest question for you know uh, FHE isn't FHE anymore. It's the key management of the Treasure Protocol for those you know composable multi-user FHE you know use cases like blockchain. Um, that's a very hard problem, right? Because you know it's not about cryptography anymore. You know this is about it's about upsec. security. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly upsec, pretty much. So we believe that a combination. So first of all, we believe that the threshold, you know, MPC protocol is probably not going to be run by the validators of the network itself because it doesn't have to be. Uh, secondly, we believe that this this KMS will probably have much, much stricter requirements in terms of what hardware should be running on, who should be allowed to run it. It might even be permissions if people want to have it like really even extra secure. So it's possible that you might have like one permissioned, you know, threshold network that everybody's using and the people running that are going to be Apple, Huawei, Zama, like, you know, you basically have companies from different countries uh, that have no incentive <laughs> to collaborate whatsoever running those things. Um, so it could be, you know, five participants, it could be 10. We even have a protocol for 50 participants. So, you know, the number doesn't really matter. It's really more about, yeah, just uh who's running it effectively. Okay. But there's no way of kind of um, establishing a scheme such that kind of you don't need the same um, encryption keys to kind of for things to be able to it to operate, right? There is something called multi-key homomorphic encryption. The problem is that it requires every participant to be online for decryption. And the size of the keys uh, basically explode quadratically with the number of users. So if it's like three people, sure, why not, right? If it's like 100 million people on Ethereum, no way. And plus, not all of them will be there. So no, no, the correct way, 100%, the correct and only way that this will work is uh, homomorphic encryption using a public key that everybody's sharing with some sort of threshold protocol for securing the private key. There is maybe a longer term idea where you could basically have uh, what's called functional encryption combined with some kind of ZK proof. So if you can provide a proof that the FHE computation was done correctly, there is a technology called functional encryption that takes an encrypted input and produces an encrypted output only if certain conditions are satisfied. Uh, the problem is that this technology is so, 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 so slow and limited that it's basically not possible right now to do it. But you know, maybe in 10 years, you're going to have FHE running on the encrypted data, ZK proving that the computation was done correctly, and the proof of the ZK protocol will be used in a functional encryption scheme for decrypting the actual ciphertext that was the result of the computation. And here, you would have a completely trustless, decentralized, no threshold, no MPC uh, protocol. Uh, and that would be a holy grail of... Uh, of, you know, FHE. Super cool. So let's talk about kind of the ways that it can be deployed today. Say I'm deploying an, an L2 on Ethereum and I kind of, I have all the necessary pre-compiles to kind of enable um, the FHE VM. Do I still use like regular vanilla um, ZK um, rollup technology to kind of prove to Ethereum that my state is correct? Unfortunately, right now, proving an FHE computation is much more costly than just redoing it. So it doesn't really make sense to use a ZK rollup for scalability in FHE right now. Doing an optimistic FHE rollup makes more sense. Uh, so I think you know that's probably what we're going to see happening. Okay. And um, how do you then deal with 
fraud proofs that you need for the optimistic ro rollup? I mean, can everything that kind of I need to um, show for fraud proof be done on um, layer one without the precompiles? That's that's a very good question. Uh, not with the optimism stack, uh, the OP stack, but with Arbitrum, you know, you can push a wasm executable, right? And so theoretically, you could compile your your contract, including our libraries, into a wasm, you know, executable and run that on the L1. Uh, that's possible. Uh, how practical it would be, I'm not sure. Uh, there are people working on FHE rollups, but it's not yet sold. But it's doable, for sure doable, I think. So I think Arbitrum style fraud proof would work better than OP style ones. And and that's um, what what Phoenix is using, or how how are they setting this up? So Phoenix just recently uh, published a white paper showing how you would actually do FHE rollups. Uh, so they have a prototype working, and uh, they're well on track to release that at some point in 2024 in production. Uh, and they use actually Arbitrum style wasm fraud proof for it. If you kind of look at L2s and L1s, obviously kind of like there, there's a huge spectrum of possibilities how to configure this. So does this work with POS, POW, POA? Um, it, can, I just, can I just set up um, an arbitrary EVM chain as long as it kind of has the right uh, precompiled? It should work with any EVM. Um, there are some, I would say, compromises if you're using a consensus protocol that doesn't have instant finality. Uh, and the reason is that if you don't have instant finality and you're requesting to decrypt something of the state, you might be decrypting something that gets rolled back at some point. So you might be leaking information that isn't actually final state. So that's why we think that like, you know, final instant finality protocols like Tendermint, uh, you know, Comet BFT and all of these IBFT sort of uh, consensus are better suited for this. Okay. You don't want proof of work or anything. Yeah. Proof of work is probably not going to do it, uh, but proof of stake, proof of authority uh, should be fine. Okay. Yeah, super interesting. Do you expect everyone who will, do, do you expect there to be specific chains that kind of are FH enabled, um, or do you think we will see the future of DAP chains where kind of a DAP decides that kind of this is really what they need and they kind of release um, their own chain? Because then obviously kind of interoperability becomes a problem again that, I mean, and, and, and I mean, with optimistic rollups, um, th this is a much bigger problem than with um, ZK rollups. I mean, I mean, bridging between different L2s um, is not ses satisfactorily solved at the moment. But I mean, I can see us getting there with um, different ZK rollups um, in due time, whereas, whereas kind of on optimism or optimistic rollups generally, it's much harder. Yeah. I think most likely, given the constraints in terms of computational power needed for FHE, I don't think that an L1 would be running FHE natively right now. I think FHE will be at the L2 or as a side chain or as an app chain. So I think you know you're probably going to have Ethereum, Solana, Polygon, all of these guys as plain text unencrypted L1s with FHE L2s and L3 applications on them. Uh, and whether you run that as app chains, as POS side chains or as rollups doesn't really make much of a difference. In terms of interoperability, it's actually not that much of an issue because even though every network has its own key, you can re-encrypt from one key to another. So when you're bridging, all you have to do is re-encrypt the value to bridge using the public key of the network you're bridging into. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. Like this is, you can take an existing bridging contract and just add that particular feature and then you're done. So there shouldn't be any more complexity for bridging in FHE chains as you would have in regular ones. But, but that's only if you don't have a contest mode, right? And on optimistic uh, chains, you inherently have to have one. So basically, you could only do this live, like after a week or so. I mean, I guess it. I, 
there's people still use optimistic rollups, right? And then they basically swap on those, uh, uh, you know, fee markets to they, they give away ten percent of the value, and then you know they don't have to wait a week, a week, right? So you could imagine that people might be okay with it. It might not be the most secure thing to do, right? Uh, but I think you know at the end of the day, the user can choose if they're fine and okay with the trade off. At the end of the day, the user is taking a risk, not the protocol. I agree, but kind of these kind of these bridge liquidity providers, um, they work by kind of um, by verifying that the claim is correct and then kind of paying out on this without right, waiting right. Okay, for sorry. the contest period. You, you mean period. in terms of like a bridge? Yes, 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 yes. yes. No, you're, you're correct. I, I don't think the bridge would be necessarily different here in this case. I think it would be the same logic again. I think, you know, arguably th that weak period in your optimistic roll-up could roll back spending, which is way worse than, you know, confidentiality in some extent. Um, I don't think it would be any different, to be fair. Or at least I don't see I don't see any particular problem right now. Okay. Um let's talk about things that are actually currently being built. So kind of we already talked about chains who may who may use this imminently. What kind of um dApps run on them that kind of um, make it necessary to have this level of privacy? You know, it's a completely new design space. So we don't know yet what people are gonna build. But I can tell you what I see people asking us if it's buildable. So there is a very big use case around um, DeFi, obviously. Uh, the ability to have confidential DeFi, whether it's preventing MEV by having your transaction encrypted up until the point that it's executed. So it's encrypted in a mempool, it's executed during execution of the contract, and it's only decrypted and made public once a block is finalized, for example. That, was, that would be one example. Uh, confidential ERC-20 tokens, keeping the balance and the amounts transferred encrypted. So you still have traceability. You still know that you and I made a transfer. You just don't know for how much and how much we both owe. And related to that, you have governance. In a DAO right now, everybody sees who's voting on what and with how many tokens. A lot of blackmailing, bribery, social pressure. If your vote was encrypted and people didn't know what you voted for and how many tokens you voted with, you would have a much, much, much better, you know, system for governance that wouldn't be, you know, subject to peer pressure and things like that. Uh, one thing I'm particularly excited about is uh, compliant uh, uh, applications. If you want to be compliant, let's imagine something very simple. You want to transfer tokens to someone else. You know, maybe that person is a different country, so there might be regulations around that. You know, uh, maybe uh, the government in your country should be allowed to see the detail of the transfer. Right? You have a lot of like those things. With a homomorphic encryption with the FHEM, you could have your identity encrypted in a smart contract. So let's say you go through some KYC. The KYC provider, you know, does your facial scan, takes your passport. They encrypt your age, they encrypt your name, your address, your citizenship. They put that in a smart contract. And so whenever you want to use a DeFi protocol, let's say you have to prove that you're not American, you could do that on-chain. You wouldn't need any kind of off-chain attestation. You would, there wouldn't be any kind of off-chain thing. You do the KYC once, they put it on the blockchain, and then from that point, you can use it to prove things about yourself. What that means is that you can have composability between identities and applications. And that I think is huge, right? And I'm pretty certain that that's going to create a kind of like white market and dark market on the blockchain where you're going to have like a layer of compliant applications where everybody's like KYC but confidential. So people don't know it's you, huh? right? Uh, that's going to be most of the volume. And then there's going to be like a dark net on blockchains, right? Where people do things without KYC. Gonna put him, sure. It's going to put a very clear price on money laundering. <laughs> well, yeah. And I mean, you know, look, at the end of the day, what people want is confidentiality. They want privacy. They don't want non-compliance. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely. just that up until now, you know, compliance meant disclosing everything to your government and to everybody else. Here, we're talking about a way to have confidential compliance. And that, I think, is really 
the trick to make this work. Absolutely. So kind of if you look at the wider context of privacy um, over the last, say, 20 or 30 years, um, the expectation that kind of things that we do is inherently private um, it has kind of eroded away, right? So basically it's kind of like um, just because there's we, we generate massive amounts of data that are analyzable. I mean, I think had the situation been different earlier, um, I, th I think we may have seen the same thing. Uh, but basically, there was no data collection on almost all of the things that people said and did and so on. And this is different now. Um, and there's already been this cultural shift um, to, um, to kind of explore Expect that kind of data that's generated can be used by law enforcement and other agencies and can be monetized. So people are no longer willing to pay for services that um, previously um, would have had to charge something just because their business model is that, you know, they use your data to kind of generate income, right? How do you think privacy solutions kind of fit into the space where kind of a lot of the harm has already been done in terms of kind of expectations? I think there is a distinction between accessing the actual data and doing something with the data. Um, for example, let's imagine, you know, you want a government to be able to uh, prevent transfers from one country to another. Right now, they will need to see all of the data from everybody making a transfer, even those not making a transfer to a blacklisted country. But imagine for a second that the data is encrypted using homomorphic encryption. The government could still apply a filter on the encrypted stream of financial transactions. You could say, I want you to homomorphically check where those transactions are going, and if they're going to a blacklisted country, just make them zero, right? So basically you send zero instead of sending whatever amount you're supposed to send. Effectively, you're blocking the transfer by doing that, right? That would work. The government would be able to prevent people from making transfers to, you know, like Russia or whatever without seeing what the transfers are. So you could still argue, well, but you know, the government in that case could apply any arbitrary filter that's true. And that's where the transparency of a blockchain comes in. If that filter is a smart contract on a blockchain, everybody can see which filters are being applied. Right? So you can have transparency of the regulation and the filters the governments are applying on financial transactions and still have confidential financial transactions. That I think is like super powerful. Right? And that I think is something that's uniquely enabled by FHE because FHE doesn't remove traceability. It doesn't hide the application. It hides the user data. I think I think that's fair to a certain extent. I mean, these rules can still be arbitrary, and then I guess it's a policy. It's a policy fight. Um, but let's look at kind of business models of kind of like big data companies, right? So basically, what percentage of the population do you think would be willing to kind of pay for an encrypted search, encrypted? social network, and so on? Probably no one or very small percentage. And I want to be clear, I don't think people care about privacy. I don't think they will care about privacy. But you see, that's exactly the goal. The goal is that nobody cares, not, be not because it's not important, but because it basically becomes something that's guaranteed by design. Privacy is something that people shouldn't think about because it shouldn't be a problem. And so our goal at Zama is to make that happen, right? We were not trying to change people's opinion on privacy. We're trying to change, if anything, developers' opinion on the importance of making their application private by design. But but even kind of in cases where um, there are good alternatives that kind of offer ostensibly the same service as kind of the data mining company, say, for instance, you could, you could use ProtonMail instead of Gmail, or you could use DuckDuckGo instead of Google. People despite the fact that kind of the marginal cost of switching to this is basically zero, people still don't, right? So basically it's not even harder to use or more expensive to use. It, it just seems 
a lot of people actually value their right to privacy at literally zero. That's exactly why the person who should care is Google. Google should make Gmail private by design. The user shouldn't have to think about switching. It's Google who should think about enabling that. And it's not the first time we've seen this. WhatsApp, you know, turned on end to end encryption to a billion people overnight. So it's possible for a large company with a lot of users to go from a zero privacy model to a privacy by design model. But you just the entire need the right business incentives. model of Google is kind of like data mining. They can still do that with the FHC encrypted data. They just wouldn't know what they're mining and what they're serving. They could literally, you, you could take an encrypted user profile and you could run an encrypted advertising matching algorithm on it. The user would still see an ad. It's just Google wouldn't know who the user is, what the profile is, or what ads were served. So it's possible. See, that, that's the thing. It's a little bit like is that it doesn't prevent any usage of your data. It just prevents the visibility of the data. Okay. Yeah, fair. I think I think I get the distinction. So um, how does Zama monetize um, all of this technology? So how, how are you guys funded? So we've been very lucky. We've raised uh, a lot of funding, a lot. Uh, so we have runway for multiple years. So we don't have to think too much about any short-term issue. Having said that, you know, we are a business. So clearly we're not a nonprofit. We're not working for free. And even though everything we do is open source, we do offer commercial licenses. Uh, so typically for a blockchain, we would take a percentage of the token supply plus a percentage of the block fees generated by the network. Uh, if there is a token, if there isn't any token, then it would basically be some kind of fiat-based licensing model. You know, we're not reinventing the wheel, right? We're doing something super vanilla. We do have a few ideas of like hosted services long-term, but for now, effectively, you can use our technology as long as you get a license to use it commercially. So the, the, the philosophy is very simple. It's completely free. It's completely open. But if you're going to make money with our technology, we should make money too. That's it. Okay, that's fair. So where can people stay in touch with you guys, kind of follow the news, join the community, learn, we you know, what can be built on top of Zama or with Zama protocols. Um, our Twitter handle for Zama is at Zama underscore FHE. Uh, we also have a very active community called FHE.org where people can learn about FHE. There is a Discord server as well that is very active with people excited about FHE. Uh, I'm also very easy to find and reach out online. My Twitter is at Rand Hindi. Uh, I try to answer as many DMs as possible, uh, although to be fair, sometimes it's a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> uh, but in general, you know, if you're interested in building something with FHE, or if your company is doing some really cool science, get in touch with me or with my team and would love to help. Fantastic. It's been a pleasure having you on, Rand. <laughs>